put for these, and we can talk about it. Okay. So, three critical thinking questions at least to start with here. So, anatomy is quite complex on both the macro and micro structure. It pose some benefits and some disadvantages to all of these. So, like, why is this good? Why is this bad? Do you think it is at all beneficial for muscle fibers to occur with different types? Okay, yes, they didn't want to be in class. Um, you can defend your answer then. And then we've already talked um, a, little, a lot about structural organization, but how might that impact symptoms of and rehabilitation from strokes and injuries to the spinal cord, as well as things like multiple sclerosis and Parkinson's? Okay, so a little more of a clinical slant on all of this. We know the most things about that. If we see certain pathologies, then can that or does that explain certain symptomologies? So let's just go around and we'll start. Callie, are you okay to start? Sure. Sure. So give me what you think is a potential benefit of the kind of complex nature of macro and microstructure in the neuromuscular system. Give you a benefit? Yeah, give me a benefit. Um, well, the benefit is that, uh, that since it's so complex, mm -hmm. you can estimate and generate the precise amount of force. Okay, that's good. It allows us to generate a precise amount of force. We will talk at great length next week as to how we actually achieve that. Good, okay. What would be a disadvantage then? What do you think would be a bad thing about all of this? Um, I said that since it's so complex, mm -hmm. there's a lot of energy required to power it. Okay. Um, so, I mean, we're, we're kind of inefficient, actually, with the you know, metabolism. We are wildly inefficient. Um, you're also going to, like, lose your mind when you figure out that um, because of all of the levers in our, at, at most of our joints, that we're also wildly inefficient mechanically from a force generation standpoint. Um, that we, and we we lose a lot because most of our levers are I have to know, like second class levers, you know, but the like the the you know the insertion is on the wrong side of the fulcrum basically, and so we're not getting any mechanical advantage. We're actually losing things. So we're not very metabolically efficient. Okay, we're not that. So that makes sense, right? So there, it takes energy to repolarize all those freaking neurons all the way down. It takes energy to resequester calcium back into the sarcoplasm in particular, in addition to the actual energy it takes to run the cross bridge cycle and help us detach actin and myosin and give us enough force. So yes, we do spend a lot of energy. The other way to look at that though is that that's good because it means maybe I can go to Chick-fil-A and have a milkshake, <laughs> right? Or maybe not. Okay, good. Megan, what do you got? Give me, so, give me a, an advantage. I kind of like put this in like take out some different things I thought were added to Okay, great. Um, so one of them, we're talking about more structural change, I'll talk about in fact, if you take like um, carcinoma clinic, you look at like the parts of it, so a hexagon, mm -hmm. uh, and I think a hexagon is the shape that the most on our side that we can sit next to each other and they're not going to be able to see. Um, it's like a, like a surprise or whatever. Mm -hmm. So I was like, that's kind of efficient in that aspect. I can't wait till we basically have the most number of um, actin and myosin uh, to have the you know, top surgery. And okay. I thought that was kind of like the so, complex but it's efficient. So why would having more actin and myosin and more cross bridges be an advantage? We have a more powerful telescope, I guess, or more, it would take less. I, it's okay here. I mean, it's just advantageous. You're right, it is, it is, right? But I mean, just more ability to generate force out of a small thing. Now we're gonna lose all that because of our levers, but, but whatever, yeah. right? Like a hexagon, that's like some Da Vinci Code stuff, right? Like it, you know, it appears all in nature in all sorts of things. These, what is that? Is that like a 120 degree angle or something? I don't know. I may just be inventing that in my head, but okay, good. Do you have a disadvantage? Um, if you have a system that's Absolutely, there's a lot of moving parts, there won't be more Absolutely, there's a lot of moving parts, there won't be more Every time we actually make it work right, it astounds me. Right? When you, when you think about all of this. 
all of those reactions and things that need to happen in the middle of this, they happen because of random chance and random interaction, right? How does, it's a random interaction of calcium with troponin that allows that to go on. And we have, we've sort of rigged the game a bit to make that, you know, kind of as likely to happen as possible, okay? But the ability of ATP to be generated by mitochondria, the ability of that ATP to then be available to be hydrolyzed and bind on to the myelin. All of these things just occur because of diffusion and just stuff is all floating around together and it just happens to bump into it, bump into the right things at the right times most of the time. Um, always kind of makes my head swim. Okay. Good. Lots of chances for things to go wrong. Absolutely. Alex, what do you, what do you got? Uh, so I also kind of got the broad uh, advantage that I you know, just talked about was the different types of muscle fibers that we have to build up to just really quickly in this situation. They can only kind of come back and forth with the imaginary light, which is one type of muscle fiber. Okay, now we're getting into question case. in the question two, but good, okay. Yeah, kind of. No, that's I, okay. Yeah, and the, from the disadvantages, I did not read all the questions, so they looks like kind of tied together. Uh, just the complexity, if you have abnormalities like muscular atrophy or like any sort of disorder, mm -hmm. kind of something that's so individual to the person that rehabilitation approach can be really, really hard. Um, I did not realize that that might not be a question. No, it's okay. The it, I mean, all of these things, there's a reason that those are, that that's the next question after what we've talked about, is that these things are all in some ways interrelated, right? Good. Good. Okay. Kelvin, what do you got? Uh, I kind of... Uh, so, there's like... Kind of goes along with what he said. There's like uh, regulatory uh, proteins and everything that uh, don't allow certain things to happen, not the most uh, signal sent and everything. Uh, right. So I think that's an advantage of being so complex, but that could also be a disadvantage as well. Uh, uh, there's so many like ways to go about something and so many steps to go through that there can be more room for error. Okay. I thought you were almost going into very Michael Scott from the office way there, <laughs> right? My greatest weakness is that I care too much and those kinds of things. I can see that's where we were going, right? Like the best advantage of the system, the disadvantage is still the best advantage and all of that. Okay. <laughs> right? We need win, 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 win. Right? So we need the conflict resolution where everybody wins, mostly me. Um, right? So, um, okay, so we're kind of getting into kind of this idea that maybe one of the primary disadvantages is that the complexity gives us lots of steps where something could go wrong. That I think that's very, very key, okay? Um, let's focus a little bit more about these, these kind of regulatory things, though. You said there are these regulatory steps that keep stuff from happening. Right? So expand on that for me on why you think having something not happen could be an advantage. Um, or why would that set up of things? Like why have the natural state be off rather than the natural state be on? It goes back into like uh, energy efficiency. So like you're gonna be spending energy that entire time. Uh, you're in an on state, but if you keep stuff from happening, then one, yeah, you're gonna like save energy and everything, but then also uh, you may not want to, like one muscle contraction, you may not want that to happen, hmm? so, but it may happen, so. Okay. Kind of no. like with the cramps and stuff yeah. yesterday, or two days ago, like, you don't want that to happen, but somehow it got through. Sure. Well, also in addition to it being metabolically possible, Right, if we have to you know, make and use sort of choline and all those other things that are going on, you know, there may actually be we have to make things, and that is if not energetically costly, it is maybe substrate costly, 
and it was time and costly to make those things and move them around. And so you know, the idea that the default is do as little as possible, um, you know, there may be some you know, some adaptive advantage to using this default. Uh, later on, we will um, once we kind of get into training and some other things, we'll talk about the idea of homeostasis and the body's you know, this sort of absolute need to want to maintain homeostasis. And when we exercise or when you contract skeletal muscle, you are decidedly tipping it out of homeostasis, right? It does not like that even if the fact that you're doing all of those things produces lots of benefits, but that's part of what drives, you know, it gets turned on, it doesn't like it, and so then that will drive adaptations that, so the next time it gets turned on, there's less disruption. We use less energy, we use less substrate, or we use a different substrate in those things, and so it, that, that also in some ways may explain kind of why, why things adapt the way that they do, okay? So, good. Very good. Okay, Jacob, you're kind of on the, the back end of this, so yeah. we may have covered everything that you had uh, that you had been talking about, even if you and Alex were working on these things together, um, which is perfectly fine. I should tell you guys that like, it's okay if you all spend time talking about these things amongst yourselves. That, in some ways, is as good as us talking about it in class because you're sitting and talking and thinking about. It. That's the point of all. Is if you're engaging with this kind of material, and I can assure you, you will hopefully continue to do that when it comes time to do your thesis or you write a paper, and you're like, "Hey, I don't know what this is. You guys do this in your lab, right? Like, can you explain this to me? Or you all tried this. How did it go? Or you know, so so sorry, it's an aside. <laughs> okay, uh, so I kind of looked at it. A lot of people do stuff like more muscular uh, lines, and that really used to like cardio and neuro. Uh, <laughs> uh, we're going to get to that. Well, I know. I was just saying I thought more of like the axon side of it rather than the muscle side. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Um, so one benefit that I think that shows up in this whole higher process is that um, it's not just like muscle movement that you can have systems and it's where pretty much the body has a bunch of different ways to account for if something goes wrong it can still function correctly uh, and like the nervous system is renowned for this and so I thought it was really interesting that it was really like advantageous that we have a higher chance of redundancy the more complex something gets and um, examples of that within our muscle junctions would be the fact that you know one muscle group is stimulated by multiple motor units so if for some reason you were to like I always think about like evolutionary wise when you're hunting if you were to get hurt and maybe some of your motor units like no longer function you have other motor units that will not produce as much force but you can still hopefully get away from the danger that you have um, and so i thought that was really cool for being a pro system sure. and then my cons kind of like tackle each other but <laughs> pretty much we're stating that you know there's all these chances for things to go wrong with all these complexities uh, and you know with the synapses that happen throughout the nervous system there's chances that you know you could have and I, I looked it up, Tedra Box, and when you brought up the last class, I actually had it on here already. Um, okay. I looked it up, and it actually blocks the sodium channels of the neurons from firing. So, okay. so the neurons from, won't fire. Okay. Yeah, so it prevents actual tensions from happening. So that's one way that just like some chemical that's not supposed to be there can completely stop everything that you're doing. Um, and then I was like, also, you know, acetylcholine, there's some types of toxins that prevent acetylcholine, which causes you to not be able to do anything either. Um, and, you know, that's not good, especially because you're. Breathing in your heart are all fired up these things. Did, did I tell you guys, and again, this is where we have the same topics in my undergrad class. Did I tell you guys about Curare on, um, on Tuesday? No, thank you. Okay, so there's a substance that is called Curare. And it was originally, and I have forgotten what it does, it, I think it. I think it blocks acetylcholine release. It does either blocks acetylcholine release or it blocks the action potentials from the acetylcholine receptor. Like it, it does one of those things. But so it was studied once it was discovered as a potential anesthetic, right? And so when they give you some kind of local anesthetic, typically what happens, right, is you know, you inject it, and a lot of them act on the nervous system side of things more so than just on the muscle because if i can act on the nervous system 
and I can prevent nerve impulses, then not only am I not able to contract the muscle, but I'm also able to, not able to send a parent signal back into the brain so that you can, right, you can imagine it, it, that also kind of makes, it seems very wild to me, like you can give me local anesthetic and then cut my arm open. It's still cut open, but it doesn't actually, the, the pain is all a construct of my mind, right? Um, which is, it just, all of these things fascinate me. They thought Curare would do that. Um, and this is why I think it's in sort of calling the thing. But as it turned out, after they, you know, would put somebody under with this, under me, but you could be awake, right? So they thought it was like a local. As it turns out, like it blocks, it may block the acetylcholine, so you can't contract. It does not block the, it does not block the afferent nerves. And so what would happen is, is they would give it to people and they could feel everything that was going on, but they couldn't move to get away, nor could they talk to be able to tell them while this is happening, that this is the thing that's going on. And so they use it now, they'll sometimes use it in like animal preps and things when they want to, you want to make the muscles silent and then look at the effects of some sort of stimulation or input of something like down on the muscle where the, the animal can't move or can't pull away, but we can do things and then measure kind of some of the afferent signal. So but this was in like the, I don't know, like the 17 or the 1800s or something. There's a whole story about it in um, one of the uh, kind of graduate level in, in a skeletal muscle book that we used when I was a grad student um, in our normal secret class. And just like, what the fuck? <laughs> Holy cow, right? I'm not sure that that's, I don't know if that's better or worse than, you know, we used to have to, some poor intern had to drink the urine to figure out if people were diabetic back in the day before we did those things. Because your urine would taste sweet. That's how they would, that's how they would, they would diagnose you. That's how they knew. Um, so you had elevated blood glucose levels, and so you would just excrete all the extra. So somebody's like, who's the urine drinker today? Anyway, so you think your life as a grad student is bad. It could have been worse, okay? Could have been worse. It could have been the 1920s, and you're drinking urine in your lab to try to, you know, diagnose these people. So keep that in mind. Right? So it is not sweet. It's very high urea content, so there we go. Okay. Um, Pearson, Ryan, do you guys have anything you would like to uh, you would like to contribute to this? Um, a lot of what I wrote down has kind of been discussed already. Uh, like group advantages being uh, like ability for stronger forces and almost kind of like customization uh depending on a certain muscle or where out in the body um since there's so many different functions that different muscles have and disadvantages like has been said inefficiency and uh, way more possibilities for something to go wrong or unexpected okay very good person very good Okay. And I kind of said the um, same thing, just like every part is just different. It needs a different amount of force to keep that certain activity or movement going. And that you have to like match a certain situation and like the, com the complexity also just has some disadvantages because like if there's a pair, there's more time that needs to fix it and like it interrupts signaling and stuff to produce what's needed. Okay, very good. Okay, so we're gonna go back, we'll go back the other direction this way. Right? That seems only fair. So for our second question, do you think it is at all beneficial for muscle fibers to occur in different types and in different joints? So to me, in some ways, these are the kinds of questions um, that I like to ask when, when we do things, because as a scientist, if you can support your answer with some sort of data, I, there may not be a right, a purely right or purely wrong answer that you can just kind of memorize and spit back. It's this idea of here's what I think and here's the evidence supporting this and then maybe here I'm aware of the stuff that might refute it, but here's kind of why I'm going to lean in this direction. Okay, so this is the kind of question that you will see things like this where I will just say, pick a side, tell me what you think, and then just defend it. Okay, 
you may defend with things from class, you may defend with outside papers, that, that part is, is going to be you know, somewhat irrelevant. Right? So, Jake, do you think it's beneficial for there to be different fiber counts? Um, yes or no? Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. I think it is. I think it is. Uh, <laughs> I thought it was a plan. <laughs> that that's not a you know I mean that's not a terrible way to to do things right right because it will obviously have everything um, but my main whole reasoning I have two reasons but my biggest one is the fact that obviously we have local type fibers and we know that recruitment happens in a certain order mm -hmm. and so um, you know once again relating to if we were back in the stone age mm -hmm. if there was if you were out hunting you want your type one fibers to separate so that way you can go for long distance of hunting to track an animal. However, if that animal turns around and wants to get you, you can instantly turn on your type twos and okay. sprint away really quick. And I was kind of confused on how you met by if there's different types of those. Like if there's one type, would it be an average of type twos and type ones together? Or would it no, you, you just have type one or you just have like type two or something. Yeah, so my answer still stands then. Okay. <laughs> I was like, if one muscle does all of it, then I guess it doesn't matter. But I was like, if it is one or the other, then yeah, it's beneficial that you have the opportunity to uh, stack on to those. So you can be like, well, I need more force, so you're able to take the muscle that are the bulk and then add the more forceful ones so you're energy efficient in a way because you're not really energy efficient on two. So if you don't have to use twos, start with ones and stack up. Um, but if you were, like I said, need to run away from a bison that's turned around and decided they don't like you, mm -hmm. you can kick in the high gear and not just like that. Bolt. <laughs> okay. Now, notwithstanding that, you know, even if you're Usain Bolt, we, we can't actually run faster than the bison. Right. But um, um, it's, it's you a know. good thought. But. Right. It's a, it's a good thought. Like, you know, you, it may take them slightly longer to catch up to you and like knock you over a tree. If you see like happens every year with the dumbass tourists in Yellowstone every year. They're like, oh, they got too close to the bison and the bison <laughs> literally knocked it over a tree. So it's always some poor sap with their like camera out or their phone out trying to sneak up on the bison. Yeah. Um, just like what? No, like just leave them alone. Like what are you doing? Okay, okay. So did anybody take the opposite approach? Anybody argue that maybe just having one? Now I would tell you maybe so that you, you say that we we have the different ones. So maybe that's all that we need to know. There are people among us that are very close. They're rare, but that are very close to only having one. And for the most part, they seem to be fine. So I don't know that that necessarily counteracts that part of your argument, but those people do exist. So I would say though that maybe that exists with the herd because they have so much stuff and they have scores where maybe evolutionary wise they have a higher mix because they needed those. They're like, screw it, we just have silicone fibers compared to more deep of a transmission network, stuff like that. Does that make sense what I'm saying? Yes. So, man, I, I saw you were going to come back and do one thing, Chuck. So, based upon what you just said, okay, do you think that we could do a study and try to look and see if this as our lifestyles have changed, if the kind of average fiber type across people has begun to converge in one direction or the other? And if so, how might we do said study? Good question. I'm sure it would be possible because I mean, we kind of know that it's potential, but maybe we'll show a lot of different things. But honestly, I am not a definite to be able to. It's okay. <laughs> probably be, you know, the average from the wild. If we don't have those numbers, do we still get those numbers? Uh, <laughs> right, if they're alive, like right, we just need to we need to find a bunch of a bunch of octogenarians. Find the oldest people that we have and you know fiber type all of them because theoretically, I don't know they're old, so they're gonna all be more we could we have to do some adjustment calculations because they're all gonna be more type one because they're older. But 
you know, their fiber type genetically hasn't really changed since they were born. So that might give us some kind of a thing. I'm sure we could do some kind of epigenetics or something and then try to figure out like in them, like what we expected their parents to have been and, you know, run things down the line a little bit. Maybe I'm just kind of wish casting now. And then we can compare that to like, you know, we're just gonna go to the go to the hospital and be like, hey, can I get a, you know, a little piece of muscle for every kid that's born, right? They won't get muscle because they're going to be not very well obviously, but they have found some older individuals that have been modified naturally that still have muscle fibers that they just haven't been able to buy out and they look at something that's different at all. That's always something too. Yeah. 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 All right, so let's see. Um, we could do some of this. Now, the other argument is that if we look at things, right, and this is the part where people have such a hard time with other things, is that if we look at things, right, and this is the part where people have such a hard time with As the son of a high school biology teacher, who when they were taught that evolution would have 15 year old students bring their Bibles in and like put them on the desk because my dad says they get different Bibles because they're like protect them from like, am I going to get them because I'm watching on evolution or something? And we can, that's a whole kind of separate debate as to the mixing of those two things or how, anyway, which I don't really want to get into in class. We can have that discussion. But one of the reasons people have a hard time with evolution is they do not appreciate what seems like a long time for us is in fact not a long time. And the idea that we can see natural selection, that we can see actual evolution in the course of just a couple of generations is practically without some sort of like we're trying to intervene. They like talk about like, oh, but like we can, you know, there didn't used to be Labradoodles until 20 years ago. Well, I mean, we've sort of intervened in the midst of all of that, right? And we can find communities, I'm sure, you know, of people where there's either been intervention or there's been a lack of things where they're very isolated and you can kind of see the evolution in that way. But in general, like 100 years, like we need, you know, we need thousands and thousands, we even know what we look like thousands of years ago to see if that is, in fact, indicative of what things might be like. Now, I wonder if we could find like some old. There's anything that we can get any kind of DNA out of the, out of the old skeletons, right, from those folks, and then we pull all the cool stuff. I mean, how we can. We can get the genes, but only we get the genes to know what they're like. Anyway, that's but that's kind of where we are. So these are the things that we might I might ask you all to do. So like, hey, let's just talk about these. I don't know. Say something. Okay, Megan, you you had your hand up very politely and had waited patiently. Okay. So I can answer yes, but there's a little part that says double back. That um, obviously sports like might be able to be like an ice for like muscle type, but also, for, yeah, but also if everyone has the same muscle type, you kind of start with the same playing field, and then anywhere after that, like if you're better than somebody, it was only due to like training and experience, not a genetic predisposition. Um, so while I think sports would be a lot boring, they would be like the same amount of muscle type, so it's not a gift. Well, maybe they'd be more competitive and therefore be less good. It's like NASCAR, right? The idea behind NASCAR is that, um, you know, is that all the cars are supposed to be basically the same. And then, so, or then they'll put the restrictor plates and things on. So whoever wins, in theory, maybe that's the best indication of who the best drivers are. Because it's not that Ferrari built you a way better car than the guys driving the Fords or whatever. Sorry, that was on, that movie's on HBO now. Ford versus Ferrari, so I've got that in my mind. Um, in the midst of all of that. So it, you could make the, I could devil's advocate you back around the other direction, right? Is that maybe everybody would either be, you know, that way and, and that's the Okay. Do you think that's going to be like competitive Sure. Absolutely. Yeah, I, think really it I mean, no, I think it would. I mean, we just might see different numbers yeah. from people, right? Like, but I think people would still be interested in, I am stronger than you, right? And I can run faster than you. Or, you know, like, these all seem like a very, you know, these are all kind of very like, I am alpha male, whatever. I am stronger than you, therefore I will subjugate you to my will, or, you know, this seems kind of like that. But I mean, it's the same thing. You know, people want to know, like, I'm competitive. I am not competitive, which is odd that I would be calling that. I'm not competitive at all. 
Um, so, but I think sports would exist, or something that would look like that, right? So, interesting. I have a second point that I was going to make. Just curious, for this example that you were saying, there was no connection to alcohol, would there still be physiological limitations to alcohol? Also, if you were to say, oh, well, sprinting is no longer about your genetics, it's about your training, so you're still going to be the con of some that's being a huge bulky person and trying to carry around a bunch of weight, and you probably don't have to even out a little better for that as well. So, um, to your first question, I think. The answer to that is there's always going to be some sort of limit on your physiology determined by probably genetics or you know, you know the, the systems, whatever the systems are, they can only work so well or so fast or make some capacity of something. And your your second point, remind me of the second point again. My second point was, you know, well I have another Alex, go back over to the door, please. <laughs> Jacob, this is your doing. You're gonna you're gonna get up and I want you to go over by that door. You're gonna get no. <laughs> Pardon? I have the feeling for some reason that like you're gonna want to just run into each other and I don't feel like there's any time. No, there will there will not be any running into each other. No way, shape, no form. Okay. He will crush me down. I mean, so what I want both of you to do is to put your, I want you to put your toes right on the edge of um, one of the, like the lines on the tiles, okay? Face each other. What I want you to do now is I want each of you to take one step toward each other and stop it, okay? So you can go like, Start with whatever foot, I don't care, but like one step, and then you can just meet that with your with your trail leg, okay? So go. Okay. So I want you to look back. Alex, you took one step. How many how many tiles did you cover? Okay. So one and a half, one. Neither Alex didn't like actually step very far. Like, but that's okay. So, you guys have exactly, let's assume you guys had exactly the same muscle. Okay? Fiber type is all type one. And yet, when you are walking, Alex covered, you know, 50% more distance than you did with one step. Now, he takes a second step, he's now covered 100%. He's covered double the distance that you had by taking. Two steps, same muscle, right? So my question then to get at your thing is, your argument of, oh, well then does that remove some of these other things? The idea that, that fiber type or that muscle type is the sole thing that determines sprinting speed or endurance capacity or your ability to do, even if your mitochondria were all the same, right? Like, they're just simple biomechanical differences. Now, if all people were the same height and had the same leg length and we were all basically clones of each other, now we have the beginnings of some sort of dystopian universe movie, but, right? And we're all machines too. We don't know who's a machine and who's not. Um, the Cylons are coming, all right? You guys can sit back down. But so in that way, right, you're thinking about it in a way that is good but also maybe you're making a little bit of an oversimplification. Well, you know, that yeah. stuff. And I was just trying to say that there's other things I could sure. which is why I was like, well, yeah, yeah. it's not just the genetics that will make that would be all the same thing, but there's a whole bunch of other sure. things. We could take two people, you and your clone, who have the same stride length and have Kelvin coach you up in different ways, <laughs> right? And one of you, you may be exactly identical. 
and because of how you've been trained, one may be better than the other, right? Like that kind of thing. So, and indeed, I think there are some twin studies that are out there where people do things like that. So, did you have a question? So, based off like because training modalities, I don't want to get in like periodization, but have you read all the have you read all the the, the, the Michigas as I call it? I know I'm not good, like, but I'm gonna use it. Or Bompa and everything and no, so there's all right, so we'll we'll back up. Um so Pearson, this is about to get really nerdy exercise <laughs> physiology, so I apologize. Um and so I'm not on a soapbox, but I am on a desk, so we're gonna call that kind of the same thing. Okay. There is this idea that many of you that have some background in exercise physiology of something called periodization, right? Which is just this idea that we are going to alter what we are doing from a training standpoint in some predictable manner, right? And in some thoughtful way where we're going to combine weight training, skill specific training, endurance training, all of the things that we think that we need and that we're going to kind of alter all of those things around around a particular playing or competition season in an effort to kind of maximize performance okay is that is that a fair enough definition Kelvin <laughs> okay <laughs> so there is a group um, led by one of Dr. Mike's former students um, there is a group that has recently written some opinion articles where they argue that periodization is basically needless or just kind of a, a needless overcomplication. And there's actually no scientific evidence to support the fact that periodization gives you any advantage over just right over just kind of progressive overload training. Just if you train right, then you don't really need to periodize. And so then um, they published a kind of opinion paper in one of the leading journals in the field, and then a article that had more, a letter to the editor that had more authors than anything I've ever seen in my life, like 50 authors on it, um, led, by, uh, led by a guy named Mike Stone, who's at East Tennessee State, who's a big, you know, has coached Olympians. Um, work with the Olympic teams, but is it they have it? They have a PhD program in basically sort of sport performance research and coaching. They wrote a thing basically saying this is all bullshit. You all are misquoting things. You don't understand anything. You've never trained an athlete. You don't know what you're doing. Basically, stop this. Uh, and then they published another paper, Stone and Andy Fry at Kansas, and I know there were a couple of other people on there that actually uh, published another paper. In a journal that's kind of basically a more in depth refutation of the stuff that came out like last week, you know, the next week, earlier this week or this weekend, saying the same kind of thing and making these arguments that, like, well, they talk about Bompa, they talk about Varishansky and those guys way, way back to the, you know, all of this. Um, and so that's why I jokingly sort of say, like, what do you mean, you know, Kelvin? Maybe periodization doesn't work, like, periodization doesn't exist, right? So now we're doing the, um, now we're into Donald Rumsfeldian, and it, it just, this all ties back into things in my life. So I'm listening to a book on tape as I commute about the, the intelligence and the lead up and decision making in the Bush administration who went to the war in Iraq. And Donald Rumsfeld, who's Secretary of Defense, famously said, absence of evidence is not evidence of absence in that way. And so I'm thinking about that kind of a thing. Well, because there's no scientific evidence that periodization doesn't work, that's not, you know, that doesn't mean that it doesn't, it just means we don't have any evidence of it in some ways, which if you've ever trained athletes, you have in one, it's like, how are you going to do a randomized control trial of periodization of 100 athletes who are all slightly different to be able to say, here's our, you know, here's our pooled effect size of blah, 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 blah. Anyway, so there, there's things. Um, sorry, that's my, I'm on my stuff. So, um, I am mostly agnostic about periodization. Um, I, I, I can certainly see the theoretical benefits of doing those things. And, you know, whatever. I'm okay. 
So sorry, we've gone very far afield of what you wanted to ask a question about. So you're going to say something about if people we had one fiber type or people were identical or something, how would that affect periodization or? Yeah, so like I, I, I would think that like some, uh, I would think that periodization would play a huge part into that. If uh, everybody did have the same, same fiber right. composition and everything, I think that would be a huge part of it as well. Now your coaching becomes much more important. Or now your, your strength coaches, your skill coaches, and those things become much better. Or it's like the Tour de France was, or may still be. It's just whoever has the best doctor, whoever's got the best anabolic, you know, anabolic regime, is going to be the people that are going to be, you know, that are going to be that way. People will find because of competition, people will try to find an edge. Right? Athletes have shown us that for forever. They will cheat in that way if you want to call it cheating. When there's money at stake, everyone cheats, not just in athletics, all right? Everything. So, okay. I've prattled on for way too long. Sorry about that, Pearson. <laughs> Chris is like, what the hell is periodization? What are these, you know, <laughs> what are these crazy coaching people talking about in the midst of all of this? Is there, are there big controversies and people get mad at each other in journals, in engineering? Is it like some big thing, like, you know, I'm a, you know, I don't know. I'm a string theory guy, and I, you're not a string theory guy. So we want to argue about the nature of the universe, or I, I, I don't know. Like, is there something similar? Yeah, sometimes it is that way. Okay. So there we go. So, okay. Um, we'll quickly talk about the last one, and then um, we can we can go ahead and get over that. So, wait, Kelly, you had a question. I'm sorry, I just completely ignored your question. Um, I was wondering if everyone has like the same height. Mm -hmm. Does when people like look differently because it seems like endurance athletes who probably have a lot of type one fibers and they're like really small and skinny versus like more strength based mm -hmm. and like they're a little they're built, I guess. Sure. It's a great question. I wonder if it's everybody that can look like different. They show us all the same like health. So this is this is great. Let's see if we can figure out that question too. So Alex, what do you think? Okay, and Ryan, you're my backup on this. <laughs> Alex gets first crack. I would think, yeah, it would look different. It would look different. Yeah, I guess I guess you could argue about what the setup of that single type of muscle would they have to look like. Okay, so uh, Kelly offered that. People that are more endurance-based athletes all, well, not all, but in general, if we were to make a broad sweeping generalization, they tend to be a little leaner, a little more slightly built, maybe less muscular. And my question is, is that a consequence of their fiber type? I think the size of the fiber. Okay. The size of their fibers might change. Okay. Ryan, are you there? So I'm just going to say, Ryan and I have a, a mutual, some of y'all may we have a mutual acquaintance, Big Cameron. Everybody knows Big Cameron? What if I told you that Big Cameron was a tremendous slow twitcher? I don't know that Cameron is slow. He would, he, would, he would say, like, no, I'm a fast twitcher, Dr. Black. I got no endurance. And I'm like, you, you, are, is that really the case? Or is it just because you, like, you know, you don't do anything other than grab as much weight as possible and throw it up and then go eat four Big Macs? Because um, that is what he does. If I would see him down there, he'd be like, Dr. Black, it was Big Mac day, right? He would go and get like, you know, $2 Big Macs, or he'd go to, you know, Sonic and get like eight corn dogs when it was dollar corn dog day. You know, and crush a whole gallon of chocolate milk. Yes. <laughs> you know, when your idea is to be as big as possible, you don't care where you get your macros. It's just give me calories. 
in that particular way. And so you ask a, a really interesting question, Kelly. And I think the nuanced answer to that is, are there some morphological kind of differences in the appearance of type one and two A direct muscle or muscle fibers? Probably. But I think most of that is going to very, very, very likely be completely trumped by what you're doing from a diet and training standpoint. And the fact that why do distance runners, especially elite ones, all look kind of these, you know, very small, very thin, slightly built, right? They don't tend to be super tall, but they also tend to have relatively long legs for their like height and those kinds of things. And there's some biomechanical, why do they look like that? Because they run a hundred miles a week, right? It is advantageous to them. So they may be small people anyway. And that may provide them some adaptive advantage to if they would train and they want to run, they may already have some built-in advantages because of their size. Whereas maybe the bigger, bulkier people just that are naturally that way, they may be all type one, but they're like, yeah, you know, I'm already this way. Like, let's, let's just, you know, let's go all in and be, you know, be a super bro, right? I'm just going to go, I'm going to eat a bunch and I'm just going to lift a bunch of weights and I'm go, my goal is to just be as big as possible because there's pretty good evidence that both type one and type two fibers will have hypertrophy to a relatively similar manner based upon their starting size if you can get people that are untrained. And, you know, and so, you know, do things kind of, in, in the idea that fiber type is gonna play some controlling factor in your appearance of leanness or your lack of subcutaneous body fat. Because I mean, a lot of sprinters are really lean too. They're very muscular, but they're really lean. They're probably not lean necessarily because they have type two fibers. They're just lean because they're lean. They just don't have a lot of adipose tissue because of what they're eating and their kind of their balance of eating and training and those things. Um, you know, in a lot of ways, the distance runners probably get to eat a lot more than the sprinters do because they're just expending a bunch of calories. So I think that's a, there, there may be some misconceptions kind of in the popular press and thinking like, oh, if you've got a bunch of type two fibers, then you're the person that's going to respond really well to resistance training and get really shredded and really big, really fast. There are people that do that, but they may actually be people that, you know, lack myostat or there may be, or have higher resting testosterone levels, or, you know, there may be some other contributing factors because weight control, we don't really understand and adiposity. These things are very, very complicated. Um, so, that's a you. It's a really, really good question, but it's it has a it does not have an easy, straightforward answer. So, I, I don't know. we could do them. I mean, we could recruit people and like you know find a bunch of people that are all basically the same fiber type. You know, we could argue that the average person is about 50-50, and so just look at average people, and people are very, very different. You know, in those ways, and so we can make a guess that it may play some role, but probably not nearly. Elvis. Same truth, maybe with like running 12 miles a day. Stupid. Why would anybody want to do that? But okay, <laughs> keep talking. And simulating like the AMPK pathway and everything instead of the mTOR. And from what I understand, uh, the AMPK pathway trumps mTOR no matter what. Mm. If you simulate AMPK, it kind of like has say over if mTOR gets gets turned off. Active. Is that right? I'm not very well versed in that sounds right, Kelly. I it's I'm not I've seen a couple of papers just in passing on things like that. We would need to look some more before I would feel comfortable kind of saying definitively, but right? Imagine this. I go run, I go run like 12 miles. I may get a greater testosterone response from running 12 miles than I get from going and doing squats or whatever you're going to do every day, right? And yet, that running of 12 miles, no one thinks that's going to make your, your muscles bigger, right? It, it doesn't happen. So, one that calls into question, and 
this will be a thing that will not be closed off in the top of the semester. Dr. Bennett's not here. I can say this. Um, okay. But there is some evidence that the acute response of the hormone change after a bout of, during or after a bout of exercise plays no role in determining what the critical synthesis response is afterwards. Now, if you exogenously enhance all of that, that's a whole separate issue. But just you go run, growth hormone goes up, testosterone goes up, epi, nor epi, all these things, cortisol, all these things go up. They're designed to make substrate more so that you can actually exercise. And so the same thing happens when you lift weights, right? They're, they're going to do this so that you don't deplete a bunch of glycogen. They're going to do this so that you can mobilize fat storage so you've got more energy. It's up, for, it's up as high for longer when you run and yet you don't get this massive hypertrophy response, which would then be suggested that there must be something else. Lots of contractions, sometimes when you run, they're in reasonably high force. There must be some other kind of switch somewhere, right, where we're not activating mTOR to the same extent. And I feel like it's a metabolic switch or something. So that maybe it is a, I, I would need to look for that. But yeah, that, some of that is, that, that makes sense. Wait, let me see this. What is what is this? This is a uh, cellular pathology. Hey, did you see one out? Yeah. It's um stimulant, inner platelet stimulant. It's a platelet that's performing the Yeah, so for intensity, right? It's this idea between you know the homogeneous. Usually it's after the Yeah. Um, and then we're going to get into necessary and sufficient, and it's a whole. There's, it's y'all just wait till we get to sort of control of metabolism and, and control of muscle hypertrophy, and I put like the whole known signaling pathways up there. Or for my my guys in Kellogg's lab, when I put the things that control vasodilation and the, the all of the known things that are up there that, that help regulate blood vessel diameter and blood flow and it's from a Harold Laughlin review from like four years ago and it's already like wildly out of date and it, it's just a screen of just a bunch of alphabet soup and you're like why do we not understand all of this well you know you make a knockout mouse where we lose one of these at a time and then the whole thing doesn't work and so it dies <laughs> oh, shit what's going on why do we not know more so, okay, good. See, he's got this. So. Okay, um, very, very quickly, sorry on the end. This is what happens. But this is why I think that these kind of days are actually quite beneficial. Where we are putting to use some of these things that you know, you've seen this stuff. We've talked about it, but now we're going to try to kind of fit it all together. So, how might we impact our symptoms and rehabilitation of things like strokes and spinal cord injuries and multiple sclerosis and Parkinson's? So, Pearson, do you, you're hanging in there with me, man. Do you want to try to start? Oh, uh, sure. I'll give it a try. Awesome. Um, I said, like with a stroke or even with Parkinson's disease, um, creates problems with the brain. Mm -hmm. uh, and when the brain can't sing, send signals, um, it creates the, the symptoms and the issues that uh, come from those situations, I guess. And um, with, I guess like how the structure affects that is all it takes is for that one thing to go wrong and it pretty much eliminates your ability to do so many things and um, there's really no way to work around it, I guess. And okay, no, that's very good. That's very good. Okay. So I've had a stroke. It's in the brain. And yet one of the symptoms of that is I can't move my foot. Right? Is there anything actually wrong with my foot? Anything wrong with my plantar or my dorsiflexors or anything? Anything wrong with the motor neurons or the axons that lead to that? No. It's all up here, 
right? So we were talking about this complexity in the system, right? There's lots of places for things to go wrong. And so I can have a problem in the brain that's going to manifest not as something that you can see as being specifically wrong in the brain or what people traditionally think of, but it manifests because it's in the motor, in and around the motor cortex as, oh, well, I can't, I can't move my foot. Right? And you, most people, their first thought is, well, there must be something wrong with my foot or something wrong with the muscle that's here. And then it's actually not that. We have to work ourselves back upstream because that's where kind of all that pathway begins with those things. Right? So if you're a physical therapist, and this works better sometimes with my undergrads, I'm like, hey, you want to be a physical therapist or an occupational therapist, someone, because it's in Oklahoma, you don't have to have a, a physician referral to go to the PT anymore. Right? Somebody shows up in your office and they say, yeah, you know, my right shoulder hurts right here when I do all of this and, you know, tell me what's wrong. Well, I mean, the list of things that could be wrong, I mean, it could be an anatomy issue. It could be something here. It could be a nerve issue. It could be something in the, in the spinal cord or back up here. It could be something in the brain. I mean, there's all of these different things, but you have to understand every step along there so that you can try to tease out and work out, okay, well, he can't generate force. Well, let's think about the things that let me generate force. What are, what's in that pathway? And then let's start trying to piece by piece, work our way through, okay, well, could it be this? No, it's not that, okay, well, then let's back up a step. Could it be this? It's not quite that, back up, and you can move yourself around. And based upon where it's located, we can then trace back to a location in the spinal cord, and also then we can trace back to a particular area in the brain, like in the motor cortex. If it's your foot that doesn't work, we know, right? Like we know, okay, that's at, you know, that's at S1 or something in the spinal cord or S2, I don't you know, I forget what my plantar dorsiflexors are, but it's also in this particular little region if we put the EEG cap on you, right, to look at the motor cortex. Or if we're gonna put you in the, in the magnet and do an MRI, on you and do some functional brain imaging, we can look and say, ah, so the, the stroke must be in this one particular spot. Don't go look over here, it's over here. So it's my right, so it's actually on this side. So we can we can trace things around because of all of that. Okay. Okay. Anybody else put something that was particularly interesting or useful that you would like to share with us for that particular question? Yes, it can very much be problematic. And so MS is such a MS is a weird is is a weird and kind of it's a weird beast in that way. In that sometimes you get demyelination, sometimes you get you know, a lot of times you're gonna get you know impairments in in and around the inner neurons and the motor neurons and the spinal cord or in areas kind of in the lower brain stem and stuff that are gonna be a problem. So like I'm trying as hard as I can. I'm really trying. My, this part, the motor cortex works fine, but I can't get the signal out. Or I can get some of the signal, but not all gonna go and go slower. And so I'm weaker. I can't move as fast. And it's just this whole kind of weird, crazy, nasty kind of pathway. Whereas you know, Parkinson's, Parkinson's is a brain deal, right? And I'm forgetting you don't make dopamine. Don't make dopamine, and so then that leads to some of the ticks and the jerkiness and those kinds of things when people walk. But then the motor cortex doesn't function quite normally. Right. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Kind of going off that point, you said that I go to someone today and I'm just going to talk to people about something, and they said we have a finite portion of data that will be wrong. Same thing with like the stroke. I mean, if you believe that, like kind of that part of the world here, like you lose your control of your foot, you don't have a full thing, you can go like it's all the time because they're trying to expedite the process of like most people can be shut down so they don't have it on the side of the We we don't 
So we've covered it at all levels. So we just don't have time to do this particular class. We've covered it some, but I thought the PhD level of neuromuscular physiology, I'm assuming that Dr. Berger also covers it. So the interplay between the nervous system and the muscular system and the ability of actually generating action potential and like turning things on, like using your muscles. Making the brain and the spinal cord and those neurons and those axons actually fire and do things is really, really good for the health of the brain and those neurons and for the health of the neurons and the axons and the neuromuscular junction is really good for maintaining the health and function of the muscle fibers. So there are these that are called neurotrophic effects where you, know, the, you, you do things that the nerves will release some of them called brain drive, neurotrophic factor eating up. And it's really, really good. So people that are not very active can sometimes get impairments in it. Their nerves will kind of degenerate. And if you can get them to be really more active, that happens. The other problem is like cell bodies and neurons, when one dies, it's gone. It's not coming back. Whereas the peripheral portion of the nervous system, so like the axons and the neuromuscular junctions, those things, um, if the neuron itself is healthy, so it can still make, the, the nucleus is still healthy, you can regrow to a certain extent axons and neuromuscular junctions and things. Um, one of my, my buddies who uh, was a, shared an office with me as a PhD student, and then uh, he has now left and gone to the dark side of painting and he, uh, he works for a pharmaceutical company and does stuff with an MS drug. Um, on all of this, but as part of his postdoc, they took uh, they took mice and they cut their sorrel nerve. So they cut the nerve that goes basically to their to their from their knee down, and they would do that on one side, and then they would put those uh, put those mice on a treadmill. And uh, quadrupedal animals are much better; their reflexes work much better than ours, or their um, flexor withdrawal and their extensor reflexes work much better. So if you can get them going on the treadmill, reflexively they will walk. And so they would take them and put them on the treadmill and have them do that. And what they found was that the animals, the, the, the higher the intensity and the more exercise that they got them to do, the faster and the more accurately their, their axon would grow back and the more robust they found, which he was an exercise physiologist, the guy that he worked for was a neurologist, um, kind of a cell biologist who did all of this, something that all of you probably appreciate. They found that they could take and exercise the contralateral nerve, and that would help regrow the nerve on the other side, right? Most of you guys, I assume, have probably heard that you know, I can train my left arm and my right, my right arm also gets stronger. It doesn't get any bigger, but it gets stronger. So there's this kind of crossover of um, you know, these nervous system connections. And so that was the, the guy that he worked for thought that was particularly great. He was like, you mean there's like undergrad exercise students that know this? And I didn't know it. And he's like, yeah. Like, this is just like, you know, this is like a thing, like a very, very, like the bros in the weight room know this. Um, you know, so there's some really fascinating things on how do we teach? How do we preserve? How do we kind of get, get these connections back when we do rehabilitation and those things? And like you've got people that are going to have ACL surgery on one side, you need to train them on their other side while all of that's going on, try to maintain some level of nervous system function that's going to be there. Um, that would be helpful and lead to them. It may not be safe structurally to do much loading over here, but you can do stuff here and it's going to cross over. Somebody is post stroke and they can't actually use their arm, have them exercise their other arm, and you're going to start kind of really ingraining that neural pattern and those things that may need some help over there and stuff. So we don't talk about that, but there, there's a lot of, we know quite a bit about like what are the signals and um, how does all of that stuff work. So the nervous system is really fascinating. And then you see a cadaver, right? You see like where the nerves are and how small they are. Those are all like bundles. When you see a nerve, you think that's a bundle. 
of those kinds of things where it's so small and it's so delicate and you think of all the times that like you've strained yourself or fallen down or let out and smashed into you playing football or something and you're like, how on earth do we not just like shred those things every like every day doing something? So the eye is a wonderful thing. All right, we're gonna call it a day. All right. So if you guys would be so kind, I will take these up and I will give them back to you next week so that you have them um, for your test. Do you want the quizzes back? Um, no, you can keep the quizzes. And then next week, we learning things. Yes. So for next week, on Tuesday, we will have a quiz on, the, you can use learning objectives from the control of force. Okay? From the control of force. I will apologize in advance the control of force stuff. This is like my single favorite thing <laughs> in the entire world. Well, that's why it's so long. That's why it's so long. <laughs> <laughs> we'll spend like two weeks doing this, okay? Um, but I will I will do what I can to, um, if you guys will remind me, I'll try to bring in props and we'll, we'll have visual aids and some things and we'll, we'll make Kelvin, you know, do some squats or I don't know. You can see how much Kelvin can curl that way. And she can shrug. I don't know. It's Thursday. What did we lift today, Kelvin? <laughs> I didn't get it in yet, so. Okay, what are you going to lift today? Um I haven't thought that far ahead. You just show up and whatever and whatever happens. You don't have some kind of periodized 